let's start the tutorial. So today I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, so first I'm going to talk about the thermal operations that you see in the lecture, which are the, the operations and the uh, resource theory of thermal states. Um, and then we'll see also how we can construct uh, thermal monotones, like from any convex function. And from this fact, you could easily, you would be easily, um, you could easily see that, for example, free energy, um, or the family of free energies, is also um, a monotone. Okay, so let us start with the properties of thermal operations. So we will consider. Uh, four properties. So the first property, so before I start, let me just remind you what a thermal operation is. So a thermal operation is when we have a system in a state rho s, and then we couple the system to a bath, which is in a thermal state of the temperature beta, of inverse temperature beta. Uh, we couple them by applying a unitary on both of them, and then we trace out uh, the bath system. Okay, and this is, we label as epsilon of rho s, and this is the result of applying a thermal operation um, given the initial state of the system rho s. Uh, as before, we consider, the unitaries we consider are the ones which preserve the uh, total energy of the joint system, of the target system, and the bath. So, which mathematically means that the unitary commutes with the, with the joint Hamiltonian. Okay, uh, a correction here. So when I write HS plus HB, what I actually mean is HS, tensor product, identity on the bath, plus identity on S, uh, tensor product uh, Hamiltonian of the bath because they're different. They have individual Hamiltonians on two different systems. Okay, uh, and as before, the thermal state of the bath or temperature beta is e to the power minus beta h bath over the normalization factor, which also depends on the beta. Okay, so the first property that we'll consider is uh, what is the fixed point of this function? What is the fixed point of the a thermal operation? And my statement is that, in fact, the thermal state on the system is a fixed point. So if I apply a thermal operation um, at the thermal state of the system at inverse temperature beta, I will get uh, my state beta again. Sorry, my thermal state uh, for, for a system S at a temperature beta again. Of course, uh, this seems quite intuitive because um, basically, if you think about it, so we take both states which are kind of free, um, and the only uh, the only state we can generate from taking their pro tensor product would, could, would also need to be free, sorry. Uh, so let us prove this, it's quite easy to prove. So indeed, let us apply the thermal operation to the system in a thermal state. Here I'm just writing the definition which is above. Um, so apply unitary to the state which is, so I explicitly write the thermal state here, so I'm going to have e to the power minus beta hs over zs, tensor product e to the power minus beta hb uh, over zb, u. Okay. Um, so, since I have this tensor product of these two exponentials, the way I can write it out, uh, which we already did once before when we were considering the uh, composability of thermal states, 
is we can write it as u e to the power minus beta hs plus hb uh, over zs zb u dagger. Um, okay, so basically, again, here by hs plus hb, I actually mean that equation up there, which is here for, for the purposes of saving space. I'll just write it this way. Okay, so then we know that this uh, expression here commutes with the u, which means that e to the power minus beta, this expression commutes with the u, and I exchange the order, and what I get is, uh, yeah, e to the power minus beta hs plus hb, zs, zb, u, u dagger, this will give me the identity, since u is a unitary, and then this is still just the tensor product on the thermal states at the system S and system B. And when I trace out the system B, I get back my thermal state on the system S. Okay, so this is the first property of this operation, that the thermal state is its fixed point. Okay, now we're going to prove that Um, the thermal operation, in fact, is um, invariant on the... Yes? Um, if your system and your bath have two different temperatures, then this doesn't hold. Because in that case, basically you would have something B to 1 HS, B to 2 HP, and in that case, like it's not guaranteed that this equation is commuting with the with the unitary. So I cannot do the same trick. Uh, so, I mean, this is all um, kind of inspired by the fact that so these thermal operations, they're always defined for, um, for a bath with a fixed temperature beta. So it's like as a, as a resource, as a free resource pool, you have this thermal state of that temperature. Uh, so kind of the correct statement here to, to make here is that the fixed point of this thermal operation is a thermal state of the temperature of the bath that is used in the thermal operation. For other cases, this will not work. Basically, this kind of reasoning. Uh, does it answer the question? Okay, good. Um, okay, so the second property is uh, time translational symmetry. So let me see that this is a fixed point. And this is time translational symmetry. By this I mean that, uh, for example, I have a system S. Um, in some state rho s. And then there are two operations which are equivalent. I can first evolve the system s for a time t according to its own Hamiltonian and then apply the thermal operation. Uh, or I can first apply the thermal operation and then evolve the state for a time t. These two things are equivalent. <coughs> okay, by applying uh, a time evolution on the state, of course I mean just the usual um, yeah, evolution given by the Schrodinger equation, which is e to the power minus i h s t rho s e to the power i h s t. Okay, to, to prove this, let us consider the left-hand side. So here we have E of ut of rho s, which is equal to 
So basically, we apply the thermal operation to the evolved uh, state of the system rho s. So it's going to be u uh, e to the power minus i s t rho s uh, e to the power i h s t tensor product the bath temperature beta and u dagger. Okay, uh, now we're going to use one property of the thermal state, which is important here, is that the thermal state is stationary. So it stays um, constant under the time evolution. So this is easy to see. So the let us apply the time evolution to the state of the bath, which is a thermal state at temperature beta. Uh, this will be given by e to the power minus i h b t. Uh, thermal state is e to the power minus beta h b z b uh, and e to the power i h b t. Okay, um, so here we have h b t, here we have h b. Clearly the, uh, the arguments of these two exponentials commute. So we can exchange them, and then what we get is like our thermal state and two exponentials which multiply a given identity, so they cancel each other. And we get back the our thermal state. So given uh, given this equation, first we see that the thermal state is stationary on the time evolution. Second, we see that instead of just writing the thermal state here, uh, we can write it uh, as an evolved thermal state for time t. So, I'll continue. Yeah? So this stays the same. Row S T tensor product uh, e to the power minus I H B T um tau B e to the power I H B T uh, U dagger. Okay. Um this can we we can further express as just the joint evolution on the total Hamiltonian of the joint state of the system and the bath. So we just write it as B U here we have E to the power minus I chess plus H B T Rho S tensor product tau B E to the power I H S plus H B T U uh, dagger. Okay. Um, very good. Uh, U commutes with this term. Um, and analogously, U dagger commutes with this term. So we just write it out. in the different order. So we get here is e to the power minus i h s t tensor product e to the power minus i h b t. I already separated it again. Um, then here we have u rho s tau b u dagger. And here we have e to the power minus i h s t tensor product e to the power minus 3 plus plus i h b t. <coughs> okay, since we're taking trace um, over the system B, here we can use a uh, property analogous to the property of the usual trace. Um, when we 
take trace over the whole system, but here we can use the same like cyclic property of the trace, but only for the sys subsystem B, which means that I can just take this term um, here and it will cancel out this term. Uh, if you if this kind of uh, reasoning is unconvincing, you can just write out um, the this partial trace and the in the base some basis for the system B, and then see that indeed that uh, property would hold when you can separate these two terms um, according to like like as a tensor product for systems S and B, and basically this would leave us the with this term which only acts on system S, this term will only acts on system S, so I can take it out of the partial trace, and then what I will be left with is this. Okay, and this is First, this is just the application of the thermal operation on the state rho s, and then we just evolve the state um, according to its Hamiltonian for time t. So indeed, this will be just evolution uh, which follows the application of the thermal operation. So for, for the thermal operations, um, they commute with the uh, with the time evolution. Okay. Um, now let us consider the third property, uh, which concerns the notion of so-called coherence modes. And let me explain in in a moment what I mean by that. Okay, <clears throat> so basically uh, the idea is that um, we can, if we have a quantum state, uh, we can always um, deco decompose it into some, um, some of certain uh, matrices which, um, which transform, transform very simply under time, under time translations, so under time evolution. And these 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 um, elements in this de decomposition are called the modes of coherence. So, basically, for example, if we have the Hamiltonian of the system H S, then for this Hamiltonian we can define so-called Bohr spectrum, uh, which we call omega. And like small omega belongs to omega. Uh, if and only if there exists two uh, energies, say EI and EJ, from the uh, from the eigenvalues of of the Hamiltonian of the system, and such that omega equals to their difference. Uh, so. So this is called a Bohr spectrum. And then we can say that for each density matrix rho s, we can uh, decompose it into a sum over omegas in this Bohr spectrum um, of coherence modes rho s omega. Uh, where rho s omega under time translation is uh, is basically e to the power minus i omega t, which is just a number coefficient, uh, rho s omega. And basically then the time evolution of the original state can be written just as some of the time evolutions of this coherence mode, which just will be sum over this spectrum. So 
So basically, it's like every component of the cell will just have an additional phase on the time translation. Okay, let me give you an example. So this is all not in words and mathematical expressions. So let us consider a simple Hamiltonian of the system S, which would be just the uh, sum from n equals zero to infinity, um, E n and n. So we have the infinite dimensional system um, and each next level has an E more energy more than uh, the previous one. So it's, if we, if we draw an energy diagram, it will be like oh, zero energy zero, one energy E and two E and so on. Okay, uh, so first, what is the Bohr spectrum uh, of such a Hamiltonian? Just from a definition. Hmm, sorry? Uh, no, so basically you can, you can take any two uh, energies from the spectrum, right? Uh, yes, so basically it will be like E, and here I'll have the all possible um, numbers from like minus infinity and so on to plus infinity, which are uh, by modulus natural. Because like I can take any two uh, energies and then I'll, I can always get a natural number. And then if I invert the the order in the um, uh, in this expression, then I'll get the opposite uh, negative number. Okay, uh, so if I take this Hamiltonian, I would claim that its modes of coherence, rho s omega, can be written in the following way. So it's going to be sum from um, n zero two plus infinity, uh, rho n plus omega over E n, uh, n plus omega over E n. So these are the elements, um, the matrix elements of the original density matrix. So say that rho s is the sum over rho ij, ij, sum over ij from zero to plus infinity. Uh, so to what this decomposition corresponds when we look at the density matrix. So for example, if we take the mode of coherence, omega equals um, zero, then this is, this is basically zero, this is zero, so we have sum over all n's, rho n, 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 n. So it will be, if I draw the matrix um, of, this, uh, of this system, this will be this, uh, the matrix which consists of these, of the elements on the diagonal, and everything else is zero. Okay, what happens if I take omega, which is E? Then this will be rho n plus one n, n plus one n. So basically it will be the shift to a diagonal. And so on and so on. Basically what we do by uh, each mode of the coherence corresponds to one particular diagonal of the matrix. And then of course, summing up all these diagonals, we would get the original matrix. Uh, now let me, let me show why this is indeed the mode of coherence. So I'll take a mode of coherence and try to uh, apply a time evolution to it.
Oh, just as a note, remember that each mode of the coherence by itself is not a valid density matrix because the uh, it's diagonal terms that not necessarily sum up to one, except for the one here, which uh, which corresponds to the mode of coherence zero. Uh, but uh, but it's still we we can still sum them up to get the original density matrix. So uh, the time evolution of the full density matrix can still be written as the sum of their individual time evolutions. Okay. Uh, so let me take the mode of coherence there and evolve it. Okay, so I try, I write my time evolution as per usual. Okay, so since my Hamiltonian is diagonal, um, it's easy for me to write uh, what what the um, time of time evolution will be in the matrix form. So what I will get is the matrix which only contains the diagonal terms. Uh, so it's going to be. Uh, let me not call this n since n already appears in a coherent state. So let me call this k. It's going to be e to the power minus i. K E T uh, K K. Then I write our coherent state. Actually, I write it like this here because uh, maybe I can just uh, delete this. Oh no. I will need some space. Uh, okay, now I write my coherence mode. So some over n rho n plus omega over e n n plus omega over e n, and then I write the um, conjugate transpose of the of the time evolution which is the sum over L uh, e to the power i L e t L L okay uh, so here I have two uh, two scalar products one between k and n plus omega over e and one between L and N. From this scalar product, uh, I can um, I can see that the only non-zero terms are those for which L equals to N. And from this, I can see that the only non-zero terms are those for which K is equal to N plus omega over E. Okay? which means that I'm only left with the, my original sum over n. Uh, here we have n to the power, so e to the power minus i um, n plus omega over e et. Uh, then I have rho n plus omega over e n n plus omega over e n um, e to the power i e n t okay so multiplying these two exponentials I'm only left so this term goes away and I'm only left with the term minus i omega t which means that I'm left with e to the power minus i omega t sum over n uh, rho n plus omega over e n um, n plus omega over e n and this is our original coherence mode
Okay. Um, so this was an example of uh, one Hamiltonian and how for that uh, particular Hamiltonian we can construct, we can deconstruct every density matrix such that um, these elements of decomposition have uh, nice time evolutions. In principle, there exists uh, a general procedure of how to construct these, um, these coherence modes, uh, but I'm not gonna discuss them here. Um, I can give you a link to the paper if you come to me in the, in the break. Okay, so this was all explanation about the coherence modes. And now we're gonna prove a property of these coherence modes, namely that uh, the thermal operation maps a coherence mode into a coherence mode. So to show this, let us just apply the thermal operation to the coherence mode. So uh, I think I can do it here, it's pretty easy. So we apply a thermal operation Uh, and this is trace B, uh, U rho S omega tau B U dagger. Okay. Um, good. Now to prove that this, this is indeed a coherence mode, we need to time evolve this state and show that it only the when we time evolve it we will only get the we will get the same state with the space in front of it so let us do this so basically now here we use the uh, the statement that we proved earlier that um, the thermal operation is uh, tra time translationally symmetric, or these two operations commute. So I can write this as first applying thermal operation and then applying the, sorry, first applying the time translation and then applying the thermal operation. Okay? But I know how to apply the time translation to the coherence mode. I'll get that my thermal operation is applied to the state. Okay. Uh, which means that this is a constant. I can just take it out. I'm left with this. Okay. Um, very cool which means that if I take the state and apply to it the time translation, I'll get out the same state and uh, with, the, with this kind of coherence uh, dephasing factor, uh, which means that indeed applying the thermal operation to the coherence mode gives you the coherence mode. Okay. Now, we'll, my final property I'm going to talk about, the final property I'm going to talk about is the convexity property of the set of thermal operations. So, the convexity property is the following. So, suppose that you take um, a thermal operation uh, E1 and thermal operation E2, then their convex combination would also be a thermal operation. Here, I'm not gonna go through the whole proof uh, by myself. Uh, Uh, because I'll still need to leave you something to do at home. So I'll just give you a hint to how to do it. So let's say that 
E1 and A2 are thermal operations, and I have some coefficient p between 0 and 1. Then I need to prove that the operation, um, let me call it C, which is p E1 plus 1 minus p E2, is also thermal. What does it mean in particular? So what do we have to prove here? Uh, to prove that this operation is indeed thermal, we just need to find uh, such unitary u such that tracing out the path on u rho s t b u dagger would be equal to uh, p e1 of rho s plus 1 minus p e2 of rho s. And let me also write out the e1 and e2 of rho s explicitly. Uh, one important thing to remember about them is we still consider that, that the, our bath, we take the bath qubits out, uh, always has a temperature beta. Uh, however, the sizes of the thermal qubits that we take for this operation and that operation can vary in principle. And, the, and they can also be different from the uh, bath qubit that we choose um, to describe this or uh, the convex combination of these two operations. So then I just label them differently to emphasize that. So I have uh, U1, so U1 acting on rho S tensor product tau 1, U1 dagger, plus 1 minus P, trace B, U2, rho S tau 2, U2 dagger. Uh, okay, two, and then the idea is uh, to somehow express this operation U via already, already existing operations U1 and U2. And the hint will be to use the following trick. So the idea for the proof is that um, the bath qubit that we're going to use to describe this convex combination will consist of uh, this bath qubit, this bath qubit, and, but also one additional ancillary uh, bath qubit. And we need that ancillary bath qubit uh, to define the combination of the operations U1 and U2. So basically what we'll have is, let me just check. Yeah. Uh, is that we're going to use tau 1, tau 2, also tau and so on. Uh, and on the, sy the system of tau and so on, we're going we're gonna, to um, choose a dimension of the system such that PD uh, is some uh, natural number where P is, um, P is this probability, or is arbitrarily close to, the, to this natural number. Then we can write the identity operator on this um, ancillary system as sum of two projectors. So one, proje one is the projector that uh, projects the system into the first uh, subspace of the dimension PD, and the second projector um, which projects into subspace of dimension 1 minus PD. Okay? So these are just uh, matrices with uh, ones on a diagonal from 1 to PD. Okay. Um, and then 
we can write the unitary uh, of the joint process as P1 on Ancilla tensor product U1 on the systems S, um, thermal system 1, and identity on the thermal system 2. Uh, so here I mean by tau 1 and tau 2, plus P2, so pi 2, tensor product U2 uh, on the systems S and tau 2, tensor product identity on the system tau 1. And if you take, so this is kind of the hint, and now everything you, you have to do is to take this unitary and then input it into the into this expression and indeed confirm that you this will be equivalent to the sum of applying these two um, individual thermal operations. Okay, I think now it's uh, a good time to make a break because I'm, these are the properties I wanted to talk about. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions, please come by. Uh, I'll continue in five minutes. So now let us turn to how we construct thermal monotones. So you already heard a bit about it in the lecture. Okay, so suppose that I have two um, two states, sigma and rho, and I can get sigma from applying a thermal operation on rho, which, like in the language of resource theories, means that from sigma, sorry, from rho, I can go to sigma. Uh, okay, uh, and then let's say that these two states have two. Uh, population vectors which correspond to their um, to the populations uh, of their energy levels which are vectors x and y and for such vectors in let's say they both live in rd uh, we define so-called f divergence Uh, for all uh, convex functions H, which are real, as the following. So F of X will be equal to sum over I, uh, GI, H of XI over GI. So GI is just the corresponding Gibbs factor e to the power minus beta EI and which is normalized. Okay. Uh, and then the statement is that F for for any such function F so basically we can take any convex real function and construct such a function with this um, thermal weights. For each such H, we would have that this F divergence is uh, G sure concave, sorry, G sure convex. So, uh, Basically, I think the an uh, analog of this G Schroer convex in the lecture was this uh, notions of thermal or Schroer convexity and also thermal um, majorization, which is which are basically identical to um, to the usual definition of majorization up to these thermal scaling coefficients. So uh, G majorization. is defined as, so x 
uh, major roises, G major roises. I'm, don't, I'm not sure where to put G, I think it's here. So why, um, if and only if, this is the similar, um, this is a condition similar to uh, to what we had for the usual majorization with the stochastic, with the doubly stochastic matrices. Uh, why I can be expressed as sum over J, uh, ah, since we said it's D, then let's say it's D, um, D I J X J, where D I J is this weight analog of the doubly stochastic matrix such that sum over j's dij gj over gi equals one so this is the same uh, but the weight version and the sum over i's is just one Okay, uh, and then basically, because because we know that um, the system, so it's sorry, the state sigma can can be um, we can get it from the state row of the system. We know that uh, the population vector x uh, must majorize g majorize the population vector y. And from this, we can show that indeed this f divergence is uh, g sure um, convex. Okay, so uh, and basically because because this this divergence is a monotone. Uh, this this should be equivalent to if x g majorizes y. This should be equivalent to f of x uh, is bigger or equal than f of y. Okay, so this is what we're gonna uh, briefly prove. Okay, so uh, let us just write f of y. So what is f of y? This is sum over i, g i, h of y i over g i. Uh, x or g majorizes y, which means that I can express y i via are the elements of x. So this is going to be sum over i, g i, h, um, sum over j, um, d, i, j, um, d, i, j, x, j, over g, i. Okay, here now I will divide by gj and multiply by gj. So what I will get is sum over i, gi, h of sum over j, uh, dij, gj over gi, xj, uh, over gj. Okay. Uh, now, this is by convexity of h uh, less or 
less or equal. So here I use the convexity of H because here I have some sum over J. Uh, then sum over I, GI, uh, sum over J, D, I, J, D, J over uh, G, I, H of X, J over G, J. Uh, I know that for, uh, for, for this kind of stochastic, thermostochastic matrix, this should be one, which means that this is equal to sum over uh, G i h of x j over g j, which is f of x. Okay, uh, from this it follows that um, f divergence is a thermal monotone. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, let me see. Uh, here, right? So, let me see. We sum over I. So here's sum over J. Yes, so this will be, yes, exactly. So here's sum over J. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, because here the GI indeed goes away. And this gives us one, right? Yes, sum over i of this gives us one. This goes away. Yes, exactly. Okay. Thanks for the correction. Uh, okay. And basically then from this, which I will not prove now, you can prove at home. Uh, one can prove that uh, the family of free uh, Redney free energies are thermal monotones. And Redney three energies are defined as uh, F alpha, defined for this population vector X uh, and beta. One, so minus one over beta z uh, of beta plus one over beta d alpha x g, where d alpha is the alpha uh, divergence between the vector population X and the thermal vector population G, where D alpha between X and G is defined as sine alpha, alpha minus one, log sum over I, X I to the power alpha, Y I to the power one minus alpha. Uh, okay, so for these entropies, in fact, so this is generalization of, um, of the Shannon entropy. And in fact, for them, you can show that in some uh, limits of alpha, you will get the usual Shannon entropy, you will get the max entropy, the min entropy, um, and other things. So 
Uh, these limits are already given to you in the exercise. Um, so, for example, um, yeah, so for example, in the limit of alpha going to one, you get the usual divergence between two probability distributions. Um, uh, and so on. Uh, if you're interested, you can try to calculate this limit yourself. Uh, or you can just write me. I actually have an exercise from last year which didn't make it in this year, which focuses exactly on this limit. Um, so if you're struggling with some limit, let me know. Uh, okay. And in particular, yeah, maybe as I said, the limit of alpha equals one is the usual limit we usually consider with the Shannon entropy. Uh, Phenomenon entropy, sorry, and the usual like free energy. Uh, so this is a usual free energy. Okay. Uh, now let me comment on the last exercise, which is yes. Uh, so, so here it's a G and here you can, this you can define for, um, for the, for any two probability distributions X and Y. Okay. Uh, so the last, the last, last exercise in the exercise sheet. So this is more of a kind of research question exercise. As in like you have to, use, there is no one particular answer to it. You have just have to use your imagination. So as uh, in the lecture, Lydia made this analogy of, um, of a resource series with a plain dough. So for example, you have a lot of plain dough of one color um, and then you allow for um, any manipulations but not discarding, then you would have uh, basically this islands of states from which you can go uh, one to the other, but you wouldn't be able to go from these different islands. And then each of these islands would be characterized by the mass of the playing dough that you use um, to create the states. However, for example, if you also allow for uh, discarding some dough while manipulating with it, um, the states that you Basically, you'll have the tree of states, and the states you'll be able to reach from any state would be the state of having no dough at all. So you, whichever, how many dough you have, you can always uh, discard it until there is nothing left. And that would be the free state of that resource theory. Uh, okay, and in this exercise, you, are, um, you can play with a different setting. Um, so you're given a different setting where you have also this playing dough, but you have different colors, basically. Uh, and then whichever, kind of whichever, you, you have to define, uh, specify your resource states, your monotones, the operations, the cost and yields of such a resource theory and so on. Uh, so for example, um, when you have many colors, some colors are, let's say, white or so, if you, if you mix it with a black dough, white dough with a black dough, you're unlikely to get your white dough back. It will all be uh, black. So you have to account for this kind of situations or think which kind of operations and which kind of states one can get. Um, Okay, and this is kind of an open question. We don't have a particular solution to it, so feel free to post on Moodle uh, your solutions or your suggestions, and um, in some weeks we'll just compile them and put them all in the official solutions. Okay, um, this is actually everything I wanted to say about this uh, this week's exercise sheet. Maybe one thing I would like to comment, uh, were these were the Lorentz curves that were mentioned in the lecture? 
So usually we, last year we introduced them a bit before uh, in the thermal part. And we also had an exercise about them. Uh, so uh, I thought that maybe you could profit from some more intuition about them. So in fact, Lorentz curves, they were not invented by, the, by a physicist, Lawrence, but uh, by a finance uh, scientist of the same name, Lawrence. Um, and they are often used to re represent um, represent kind of uh, different financial stats of, of particular nations or countries. So as you remember, the Lorentz curve is, so suppose I have a vector of n components, and then I order this vector such that it's, uh, it is uh, in non-increasing order, and then for each, for each element of the vector, I kind of take and add up the corresp its corresponding weight. Right, and in the end, it all sums up to one. So, let's say this is one. Okay, so now imagine that um, we're looking at the vector which represents the um, kind of the wealth of the different members of the population. And this is like a huge vector, many millions of uh, entries. And then you want to uh, draw a Lorentz curve for this vector. Uh, so which Lorentz curve which correspond to a uh, population where wealth is distributed equally? A line, right? Yes. It's the same as uh, yeah, maximally max state, right? So we just have a line because every time we add the same amount. Um, okay, so this is kind of our um, kind of ideal situation. Uh, now, for example, if um, if one person if one person in a nation has uh, ninety nine percent of the wealth, how would the graph look like? Yes, exactly. It's going to be. Something like this, right? And you see basically that, uh, so these are our two um, extremes, right? And between them, it can be anything, like any kind of curve, which here, because there are many components, our I draw is a continuous curve. And then basically by just like looking at the Lorentz curve of a particular country or a particular um, yeah, representation of the population, you can immediately say what to um, whether it's closer to the like ideal equal distribution of wealth or the unideal uh, accumulation of wealth to um, in the hands of a few people. So it's kind of a very powerful uh, graphical tool, which is also useful to represent any other kinds of. Um, probability distributions to, uh, in order to compare them between each other, and compare uh, them to the, to this maximally mixed scenario. Yeah. So, if you're interested, you can just Google like this, different stats, uh, Lorentz curves of different financial stats, and um, they they just show very vividly what's happening and how a situation is. Okay, um, I know it's early, but I think I'll, I'll finish for today. Thanks a lot for listening, and uh, probably see you next week. I'm not sure if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give the tutorial next week. Uh, it might be Marco uh, or Lydia, because I might not be here, but let's see. Thanks a lot.